Okay. So what I'm talking about today is global health policy and what love might have to do with this. So when people think about policymaking and policymakers, they often think about faceless people and the documents that they produce in bureaucratic scenes, like this uh, example from a 1980s dystopian uh, tragic comedy, Brazil, where um, this kind of uh, complicated narrative and faceless people leads to disaster uh, using absurdity. So I'm Jem. I'm an anthropologist, and for the last couple of years, I've been studying some of the supposedly faceless people and the bureaucratic processes involved in what gets glossed as global health policy. And this talk is going to be about them. It's also about love and policy and time and the struggle to be alive and the awful, wonderful, double-edged sword that is human nature. So the policy-making efforts that I've been studying particularly concern, as Gail said, a progressive skin disease affecting the feet and legs, which is podoconiosis. Podo means foot and conio means dust. And it's caused by a mixture of genetic susceptibility and walking barefoot over time on volcanic soil. So we don't know exactly how many people are affected, but we know it's at least 4 million. Shoes can prevent it, specially adapted shoes like these shown up here can help stop it progressing once started and make it much more livable. A lot, therefore, of what helps with podo seems overwhelming or it seems fixable with simple and material objects like shoes, like these, which are a version of those shown in that picture. But the act of being able to put on shoes can be quite hard to do. And this is a little bit like anthropology. Anthropology is essentially a comparative exploration of what it is to be human across time and place. Now, evolutionary anthropology represents a deep time perspective of what it is to be human. Social anthropology, its sister study, which is what I do, is more contemporary, and it's a study of all peoples everywhere. So, like these string figures, which might be recognizable to some of you, they're found all over the world in multiple forms, even in groups of people that have no direct relationship to each other. So social anthropology is looking at what people make and what they do and what they think and how they organize their social relationships and societies. And the bedrock of doing this is always trying to put yourself in the shoes of other people. So from doing that over the last decade or so, there are two things that I'm certain of. And these are things that both evolutionary, the deep time perspective of anthropology, and social anthropology tells us. And this is that human beings as an individual, as individuals and at a group level, can be entirely different from each other, but they can also be strikingly similar. And one of those striking similarities is their capacity to be moved. So moved to do awful, seemingly humane things, as in the image of um, bureaucracy from Brazil, often in the name of love, and also move to do wondrous, seemingly superhuman things, again, often in the name of love, which of course is something profound about the nature of humanity. So lately, a lot of talk about global health policy practices has been focusing on this awful side of humanity and really talking about annihilation. So the bureaucratic processes and the faceless people and the faceless documentation that condemns whole populations to die. And these are really about the ways that policy practices can add up to the condemnation of whole groups of people. And when it's talked about, it's often referred to as necropolitics, which means kind of power over death or policies and practices that create death or half-life situations. Now, if we think about podoconiosis, a dystopian future could have looked like a situation when the 4 million people that have this progressive foot disease multiply and multiply and multiply ad infinitum. But it doesn't actually look like that now. And the reason, one of the things that I've been trying to do is to figure out why it doesn't look like that now. Perhaps it's not pushed as far as it could have been. The dis a disease which is preventable has not been eliminated, but equally, we are not drowning in podoconiosis. So today I want to share with you some related or counter-narratives to necropolitics, to this politics of death, that help explain why we're in that situation. 
And I found over time, over the last couple of years, that all of these are about, are about love in multiple different forms. And the reason I want to talk about this is not really because of me, but it's because some of the people that I've been talking to and trying to put myself in the shoes of who've said things to me like this. As a human being, when you see those things, you cannot really tolerate them. It's just very, uh, makes you so compassionate and passionate to really do something about those things. So, uh, yes, in the policy uh, making process, this, has, uh, this must have some kind of influence, I believe, and uh, people could really appreciate how painful, how miserable uh, people are, and so on. I think I, I consider this one as the most powerful driving force for, for policy making for people to take issues to the highest uh, level of uh, you know, policy making. So Tashome here is talking about compassion, he's talking about friendship, he's talking about human connection and things that make it suddenly and abruptly possible to put yourself in someone's shoes for a moment and how this might be a very important aspect of how we move forward and how we drive change. Now, Tashome is also known for being very joyful. So this is the other part of love that I wanted to talk about. It's not just about compassion, but all about pleasure and joy and excite excitement. And um, love is something about being with other people and what that means for the acts that we do in the world. Now, earlier, I said that the bedrock of anthropology is trying to put yourself in the shoes and trying your level best to put yourself in the shoes of other people. Now, the shoes I'm talking about in my particular research is not the shoes of people living with podoconiosis. There are others in the large program that I'm on that are doing that. What I've been trying to do is to put myself in the shoes of all the people that get glossed in the messy world that we think of policy making, this big concept that's hard to think about. And some of these are government officials, some of these are researchers, some of these are NGO workers. Many of those people have worked in all these different um, positions over time. And just to convey what I've been trying to do, this you can tell, as depicted by a friend and colleague of mine that I've worked with for about 15 years, who likes to, we work together to draw and imagine scenarios to try and convey them to audiences. And this is me interviewing one of my research participants outside of a busy WHO meeting in Geneva, sharing, um, he's telling me a very interesting and passionate story about how he first got into the work he's doing and chose to follow a line to its conclusion. What I wanted to do was now to take you to listen to a couple of the voices of the participants that I've been trying to put my shoes in, because some of what anthropology is about is trying not only to put yourself in the shoes of others, but also to try and catch some of their feelings, to try and catch, albeit really partially, the emotions that they are experiencing when they're recounting it to you. And these two examples are one of many that I've been encountering in my research. So they're going to be talking about moments which move them to continue a line which has led to a change. So the first one is joy. Thank you. Oh, because there's no one else in the because world. Because there's no one else in the world. And because it's such an awful problem with such a simple solution. And, and also, you know, it was a mystery as well. I love, you know, the idea that there's so much still to find out about, you know, really the nitty gritty pathogenesis. Yeah. And, you know, the impact of seeing the first patients has never left me. I mean, probably the first um, clinic, outdoor clinic that we went to, uh, I just asked if one of the, one of the Mossy Foot um, staff, I think it's probably their social worker, um, could could help me chat to a few of the patients, and I, you know, talked to several of them through him, and then you know came across a sixteen, roughly year old girl called Lydia, mm -hmm. who had tried to commit suicide about a week before by jumping from a tree because she had noticed her legs swelling and knew what that would mean. So, and I think people in her family had the condition and so she, she'd seen what effect it had on them and so could imagine what 
it would be late for her. They tried to kill herself. So thankfully someone had brought her down and someone else had said, oh, I think there's somewhere you can go. Um, and, you know, there she was just sort of you know, really depressed, clearly, and um, with pretty good feet still, you know, a bit of swelling, but you kind of thought, oh, it's going to be all right. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you, you never forget that, really. Does she come back to you sometimes? Oh, I mean, all, all the, I mean, it's just so, it's so powerful, really. You, you, um, and, you know, when your own children reach that age, you kind of think, yeah, well, you know, why are the people, why are there all places in the world where a 16-year-old girl can, can want to kill herself because of a condition that's completely preventable? Yeah, um, avoidable death. Avoidable, totally. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And the distress around it, you know, it's not just being knocked over by a bus, it's realising this is happening to you. And... So, people talking about moments like this, reflecting back on things that happened to them many years ago, that come back to them and move them forward and keep them going, even when things might feel improbable and impossible to achieve, is not only talked about by people, I guess, in the global north going to a different place. I've also found this in participants who are doing research within their own countries. Change, but just let me share with you one experience. Yes, please. So one day, while I was doing uh, my round, mm -hmm. you know, those days we didn't have separate uh, wards for children. And while I was doing the, my round, this child was like 10. And uh, he asked me one question, which was still trickling in my ears. You know, he said, oh, doctor, am I going to look like uh, those uh, individuals, those old guys when I am older like them? He asked me, oh, you know, this was very shocking for me. Mm -hmm. I knew the answer. Because of our health systems, uh, negligence, I, I think he's going down to go down here, but I lied to him. I comforted him. I said, no way, you'll be fine, you'll be okay. And this, I, I just uh, talked to him in good words. And then I think I left Amref. I left uh, the alert hospital and I joined Amref in Kenya. And you know, his, his level of his sound still clicks in my ears because I have the feeling that I lied to this boy, actually. I really lied. And with the level of care in the national uh, setting, I, I don't know how he is now, but I wish I see him. I, I made some attempts to really follow him and see him, meet him at some time, but I, I have failed. But my conscience tells me that I have really lied to this guy to this boy uh, so much, and uh, that makes me really unhappy. So this is a scenario, the two scenarios. So this true scenario that Barlock is talking about happened in 2001. And when we were reflecting about this together in 2003, we both agreed that this wasn't so long ago, really. And what's really interesting about this is that this is a person who was a medical doctor who left doing medical doctor things to follow a line and a career that led them into doing public health work to try and scale up from these small experiences and to try and see if they could influence policy on national and global and international levels. And Barlock's words, this still trickling around in my ears phrase, has been trickling around in mine over the last two or three years because this interview that happened very early on really prompted me to look out for people talking about these moments, to talking about memories, to thinking about time. And I found this longing to go back in the past and change things as something that seemed to be quite key to driving people forward. Now, this is not all rosy and happy and uh, moving forward, love. It can also be very heartbreaking. And Lima, is one of those of my participants whose heart is breaking at the moment. Now, 
She didn't want her voice to be heard, but she very kindly agreed to let me read her words. And this is what she told me in an interview that prompted me and Johnson to try and draw and paint her experience to convey it to you. So this is Lima. I work in basic science in the immunology of diseases, previous TB, now podo, podoconosis. I love my work, but sometimes I think, is it really ready for the people immediately? And I'm really worried about that because the basic research takes a very long time. People are suffering and new people are also catching diseases in the meantime. I usually work in the lab separate from people with podoconiosis, but I've seen some of them, even at a distance. And I usually feel so bad because of their suffering and I want myself to be involved in solving such a problem. And then I wish I would be happy if I can contribute something for them immediately, rather than talking and writing and talking and writing, or even doing the lab work. It might be useful for future generations, but it's not useful for the existing people. So then what do we do with this? How do we cope with the, improb the impossibility of working on tasks that might seem futile when we know that this kind of basic lab science is also a vital part of the, the puzzle to try and solve and move things on in policymaking practices? And so one of the things that we can do is think about and be attuned to situations such as this one. Now this is a painting that I constructed with Johnson about a real event that happened um, a few months ago. And we decided to entitle it, When Zara Cried, Everyone Cried, and the Boring Meeting Became Important. And the context of this is a boring meeting. Um, boring meetings which are important for getting the business work and the job work done of practices this is a research meeting, but it has a strong policy component. And in the middle of this meeting, Zara said this. My comment is that this program is good news because those patients have been really neglected for a long time. I grew up in a rural area. I know what you are talking about. My classmates who had parents or siblings with prodoconiosis in that period long ago, we could not even eat together. It's really sad when I think about it now. I think my classmates, how they felt at that time, I feel guilty and I don't even have a chance to say sorry to them. So in this meeting, this moment was something I was there for. And when I heard Zara say this, I got goosebumps on my hands. And being an anthropologist, I wanted to test out whether other people were feeling that too. And I turned to the people who were sitting next to me who were actually funding the research and policy programmatic activity and asked them how they felt in this moment. And one of them turned to me and she showed me her arm, which was tingling. Now, this was minuted in our minute, in the minutes of the meeting as Zara shared her feelings on why this research program is important from personal experience. And that is a very true representation of what she did, but it doesn't really capture the emotional human connection of what that moment actually did for the people attending that meeting. And after the meeting, and after I'd been thinking about this and got this painted, I sent it off to various people to get some feedback who were there to test out whether my feelings were their feelings. And I got this message back from the representing funder from the Global Health Programs funders in the UK. He said, thank you, dear Jem. Thank you very much for sharing this art. Um, we, the energy of those gathered around the table that day was palpable and we too felt the intensity of the emotion shared that day. And it reminded me of what she said at that point, which was, really, we've not got to sweat the small stuff. Now, what, these, what Zara's example in this meeting makes me feel like is that 
When confronted with overwhelming feelings of impossibility about how to fix awful problems, how do both individuals and groups find ways to keep going? How do they change directions but still keep driving forward and follow a line that might be very wobbly and double back on itself, but still moves forward somehow? And how can the sum of lots of small acts or ordinary everyday mini miracles, and I would class that moment in that meeting as a very tiny miraculous moment, how do those efforts add up to something? Because we can't manufacture these moments like Zara's, but we have to allow for them and they have to be seen and they have to be felt. And there's a small reason why this is important. And this is partly because all meetings can be boring and they can all be important and vice versa. But also on a bigger, more kind of evolutionary anthropological level, if I take you back to necropolitics and the way in which humans can act to cause horrible things to happen. <laughs> the danger of those narratives around necropolitics is that these narratives of annihilation, which are really important that we recognize, they can also induce nihilism, so giving up on everything, because it becomes very hard to see a line forward. And so people who might be able to continue doing things and making change can collapse and give up. This is partly because people and theorists and uh, popular discourse has really taken this narrative and run with it. But actually, if you go back to the original theorist who talked about this, he had a very important colliery or additional narrative, additional concept that he was talking about at the time, which is about change. And it's equally powerful and it leaves some space for hope. So he said this, change does not move in a closed orbit, but rather it points in several directions at once and simultaneously occurs at different speeds on different timescales. He also said, life is rich in unexpected turns, meanders and changes of course, without this implying they're necessary. And I would argue that it's probably quite important to recognize that both love and policy is like that. The end. <laughs>